I want to welcome uh, want to welcome everybody who is joining into the call right now. Um, I am Jay LaBeouf, and welcome to uh, Careers in Media Technology. As we're talking this week with Gordon Lyon, Principal Product Manager at Adobe. Um, so the purpose of Careers in Media Technology is to take you behind the scenes into how the media tech industry really works, and. Uh, over the next couple of weeks, we're exploring some of the roles, responsibilities, and skills um, of people involved in this pretty awesome industry. It's a place I've been involved for the past 15 years, and we do it because we can seamlessly blend our passion for music, media, and video uh, with a pretty good career in the tech industry. It's like blending your night and weekend work uh, with your day job. Uh, so let me pull up a, a quick slide to kind of context set what we'll talk about today. And for those of you just joining, there's a chat window or a, a Q&A bar that you can see. Um, so, all right, let me show this to you. Um, so this week we're joined by Gordon. Um, I'll give Gordon a quick introduction in just a second. Um, again, as I mentioned, uh, Careers in Media Technology is our free online course available through cadenze.com. Um, we have five weeks of content that take you through how the media tech industry really works. And I'm pretty uh, pretty excited to, to, to kind of share this experience with everybody. Um, one thing you might want to know, for those of you who are joining in, if you do want to enable your video, you can uh, ask us a question directly uh, using your video and mic. Or alternatively, um, uh, you'll, you might see a, uh, a Q&A box on the right side of the screen. Uh, please use that to submit questions to us as we go along. Uh, several of you have submitted questions in advance. As well, you can submit your questions uh, directly to me at uh, j at realindustry.org. Uh, so thanks again for uh, for joining in. And so let me turn the screen sharing off and get back to uh, get back to Gordon. So uh, I'd like to welcome a, a good good colleague and good colleague, friend, and mentor, uh, Gordon Lyon. Uh, Gordon's a principal product manager at Adobe, and he's held roles at Sega, Nexedia, Gobbler, Avid, DigiDesign, um, and he's a, a creative experienced product development professional with a tremendous experience and a, a really interesting background. So uh, Gordon, welcome to, uh, welcome to our chat. Thank you so much. So good to be here. Um, I, I'd love to get the uh, the question started uh, with you telling us a little bit about your background, uh, what you studied in school, and kind of how you ended up in product management. Um, it's an, uh, it's kind of interesting, especially for this audience. I started in college. Um, I started out to be an aeronautical engineer and changed my mind somewhere in the middle of that and decided I wanted to be a recording engineer instead. It was a very different field and started working in recording studios when I was in college. Uh, and I remember graduating from college and my mom saying, okay, well, now that you're out of college, when are you going to go get a real job? Um, and I don't think I spoke to her for about six months after that. I think if she, <laughs> she looked at me now, she, it would be something much more that she would recognize as a real job. Um, but it was kind of a circuitous path to get here. Uh, I did go in, uh, I stayed in recording engineering for quite some time. I was always um, musical, but I was never a good musician. I could never get, you know, this, this thing together. Um, but I knew that the recording engineers existed because there was an interesting balance to me between the creative and the technical part of that. And there are interesting things that happen, things that you learn when you're a recording engineer. The job itself um, is sort of one third technology, knowing how the bits and pieces work and how to make a recording. Uh, it's one third creativity, which is knowing what's going to make somebody dance, how to make something sound good, um, how to make something feel emotional. And it's one third personalities. It's about understanding how to get the best performance out of people, how to motivate them to do the best they can, how to coach them to do their best work, um, and how to handle some difficult personalities. And when you start working with um, really high level stars as I managed was lucky enough to do, you get some very interesting 
personalities and some very interesting personality challenges. So I went on to work with assorted people like Whitney Houston and Aretha Franklin and, and uh, a lot of R&B stars, a lot of European artists and added up about 15 platinum records. And that was all well and good, but I actually got to a place where I was a little bit, I was feeling a little bit limited. And somebody called me at a time when uh, Sega was launching a new game console which had real audio in it and they decided that they needed somebody who understood real audio to make video games so they brought me in and they said right we're going to have you build a fifty thousand dollars studio you're going to have to crank on it eight hours a day and everything is going to have to sound good on a half a megabyte of ram so and having come real audio yeah real audio yeah. and half a megabyte of ram and i was like okay that sounds like a challenge um so i went to work for sega and I was there for just a couple of months and I started working with the guys who were trying to program the sounds for the console. And I looked at the tools they were using and it was taking them forever to get anything done and they were having to type everything. They were having to command line type where they wanted something left or right or program in volume things. And I looked at them and I said, this is crazy. You can't, you can't do anything fluidly this way. And so I started talking with the people who were designing the software for the audio developers. And I said, really, if you want to turn something up and down, you need a slider that goes up and down. And if you want something that goes left and right, you need a knob that turns left and right, because this is how people work and think when they go to make music. And they were, oh, that's very interesting. So they were, these were, you know, these were game console developers. These were not musicians and they were not recording engineers, these were not audio people, they were code writers. And so they wrote code the way that code writers do. And that was kind of my introduction to product development. It was um, learning that there is a difference between how something works behind the scenes and how you need it to work as a human being and what's going to be intuitive, what's going to be easy, what's going to help you to be creative and bring out the best. Uh, in you and so that's that's how I got interested in product development and I worked for them for a number of years and then went on to work for uh, Digit Design on the Pro Tools team uh, as their product manager for post-production uh, and then eventually moved into video production with them and overseeing large portions of the whole workflow for post-production for them did a couple of quick startups uh, after that I went uh, to one small startup that did very black magic stuff with voice recognition but really really fascinating things. We had a, a demo where you could search 250,000 hours of YouTube videos and find any place where somebody had said the words Barack Obama and play them in about three seconds. Um, I was constantly afraid we were going to be burned at the stake for this kind of stuff, but very interesting uh, technology that's used um, in a lot of different ways now. And in fact, they just won an Emmy last week for the software that we built three years ago. Um, and then for another small startup doing cloud-based collaboration for musicians and landed here at Adobe in June, helping them to actually uh, build out a stock imagery and video service which integrates with all of the Adobe applications. So Photoshop, After Effects, Illustrator, Premiere, all of that. Um, so it's been a kind of an interesting road to get here. Uh, but it all really started with looking at those one guys going, you can't type volume information. That just doesn't work. So. Awesome. Well, you know, one of the things you, you stated of, you know, being a recording engineer, having the, you know, one third, one third, one third. Um, how would you explain to students who are interested in this role? Is there a one third, one third, one third that makes up a good product manager right now? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, you know, it's it's interesting because you can go out and if you look at product management jobs online, and there's always plenty of product management jobs out there, you will look at the job description and the job descriptions are all the same. Whoever wrote like patient zero job description for product management, they've all been copied from there and they will all tell you pretty much the same thing. Um, they will tell you, you must have good communication skills. They will tell you, you must have an attention to detail. They will tell you that... Uh, you must um, have passion for the product. And then there's a couple of other things they will tell you. They will tell you, you must have a degree in computer science. This is absolute garbage. 
So please do not let yourselves be discouraged by that at any point. I know very, very few product managers who have degrees in computer science. It's a nice thing if you have it. It is absolutely not required. Um, and the reason it's nice is just because it helps you to talk to engineers, which you do on a daily basis when you're a product manager, but it's not required. The other thing a lot of them will tell you is you must have an MBA. Also, garbage, garbage, garbage. The vast majority of the product managers I know, and certainly the good product managers I know, don't have MBAs. So don't be discouraged by, by that sort of thing. What is required for being a good product manager um, is attention to detail, because the devil in any product is in the details. Uh, there are, you can make very little, you can make very tiny mistakes that have very huge impact. Um, and that's, that's really easy to do. So that kind of attention to detail is important. Um, it really helps if you are passionate about the product that you're working on. Uh, the best products that I work on are products where the people who develop them actually use them. So uh, at DigiDesign, Pro Tools, it was great. You could walk around and look in everybody's office and everybody had guitars or drums or something in their office because they were all musicians or they were producers or mixers. And they would go home on the weekend and they would actually use the product. And then they'd come in on Monday and they'd be all energized about it. I want to do this. I want to fix this. I want to get that to work. Good communication skills, absolutely necessary, but more importantly are relationship skills. When you are a product manager, you bear all the responsibility of the success or failure for the product. Uh, but you have direct control over no one. So anything you want to get done, you have to get done either through diplomacy or subterfuge. I've tried both. Subterfuge will work when you need it to. Diplomacy, much better way to go. So being able to build good relationships with people, know who to talk to to get things done, and knowing how to speak to those people specifically. The way that you talk to developers, very different from the way that you talk to marketing people or from the way that you talk to C-level executives or the way you talk to salespeople or customers. So it's very much about the relationships and your interpersonal skills and your just passion for the product and your real stick to itness to work it through and get it right. And I can imagine uh, some folks wanting to dive in just a, a tiny bit on talking to, let's say, an executive versus an engineer versus somebody in marketing differently. I mean, are, are you meaning more conversational style or goal-oriented discussions? Both. So um, let's take, for instance, uh, this, let's start with the C-level executives. They really don't care about what color the button is going to be, but they want to know, is this going to make money? Is this the right decision? How do you know this is the right decision? How do, who have you talked to about this? What is the kind of data or what kind of evidence can you bring to me? And can you bring it to me quickly? Can you bring it to me clearly? Uh, I find that when you're talking to executives, they're very busy. It's best to go to them with a yes, no question. Don't give them three choices. Say, we do this, you get this. We do that, you do that. What do you want to do? And they'll give you an A or B. Much better. Sales and marketing, you really need to speak to them about the user experience. What is the benefit that the end user, the person, the person that you're hoping to sell to or support is looking for? Again, they don't care about the color of the button. They don't care about the layout. But what is the real benefit that comes out of it? You can say, yeah, hey, listen, we can sell you, you know, 250 photographs a month. That's great. But what's really important is that you can find those photographs in a minimum amount of time because the way we've done it makes it much faster to find what you want. The way to get it into your application is much cleaner, and so you're going to save time. You're going to, it's going to be easier for you to get approvals from your clients. It's going to cost you less. Those are kind of benefit-oriented things. When you get down to talking to developers, you have to be much more kind of literal um, and very precise about what you're talking about. Um, and I've worked with some, some engineers who you know, if you don't, if you don't write it down, it's not going to happen. And if you do write it down, it's going to happen no matter how big a mistake that was for you to write that down or how vaguely you could put that. Um, and that's not to say there, you know, there, there are those who you can talk to and you can kind of give a general idea in agile development. It's very popular to say, okay, well, listen, I'm just going to give you a user story from my perspective, right? So as a, uh, 
as an art director, I want to be able to scan hundreds of photos on my iPad very quickly so that I can make decisions about which ones to try in my advertisements later. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, a good architect will figure that out and run with that and come up with a nice UI design. Other engineers, depending upon who you're working with, you're going to want to make a mock-up that shows them every step of how that goes, where the buttons are, um, what the buttons say on them. So even within there, you get a lot of you get a lot of variation. But again, you're going to want to be kind of as specific as you can. So I, I want to uh, uh, kind of di dive into the the actual project and product uh, creation process. So we, we have a a question submitted from Kareem. Um, and uh, Kareem, thanks so much for writing in, and um, for the, all of you that are also joining in, feel free to submit more questions through the Q and A app. Um, so Gordon said at the uh, at the beginning of a project, um, what kind of market research do you start out with, and do you find is more effective? Um, and then he has a follow up uh, follow up one, which is, um, can you talk about? Uh, uh, it's a product manager's job to understand financial modeling as well. Um, you know, it, it, the product management role is fascinating, and I, I think it's especially unique. Be, well, it, it's unique in its flexibility. There is a huge array or sort of a, a, a spectrum of responsibilities that you can take as a product manager and, and approaches that you can take. Um, you can be highly tactical, which is about all the little items uh, that need to get done. You can be highly strategic and you know really back up and look at the big picture uh, and go, okay, well, these are the, the, the kinds of problems that need to be solved. These are the trends in the industry. This is where we're going to want to be in five years. Um, or you can settle somewhere in between. Usually, at different phases in a project, you're playing different roles. Um, oddly enough, it's really good to be good with the financials, both in the very front and in the very back. Um, and I'll explain why. So if you think of the product manager as being a mini CEO, as being the CEO of your product, uh, only without having to do all of the fundraising that's usually <laughs> involved in being a CEO, um, then the first thing you're going to want to do as a good product manager is try to identify a problem that your customers need to solve. And sometimes you have to even define a market. And you sit back by just going, you know, hey, you know what? I want to be, I want to make apps for musicians. Okay, well, that's pretty broad. Well, say, okay, let's say I want to make an app for uh, guitarists. Okay, well, what's a problem that guitarists have? Well, uh, I want to do something mobile because that's a thing. What's the problem guitarists have on the road? Well, they have trouble uh, finding guitar repair. Okay, great. So you go out and maybe you talk to, you start with kind of a hypothesis. Go, okay, well, I think this is probably a problem. For touring musicians, they don't know where to get their guitars repaired. So maybe I will invent an app that helps them find guitars, you know, guitar repair places. And so the first thing I would do is try to identify or find a half a dozen or a dozen guitarists, maybe two dozen guitarists, and maybe there's different kinds of guitarists. So I kind of come, well, okay, there's there's rock and roll guitarists, and there's blues guitarists. Okay, well, maybe that's not the right separation. Maybe it's electric guitarists versus acoustic guitarists. Or maybe it's guitarists over 50 or guitarists under 50. Or maybe it's guitarists in the south versus guitarists in the north. You don't know. So you can go, okay, we've got these kind of different groups. So let me talk to a few of each. And you start talking to them in person, and the idea there is to have very open-ended conversations with them, because you don't know really what you're looking for yet. And that's where the in-person conversation comes in great. You walk in, you say, hey, tell me about your day. What are the problems that you have? And see if the problem you're thinking of comes up. Maybe somebody mentions a problem you hadn't even thought of. You go, oh, I've got a brilliant idea I hadn't even thought of until I talked to this guy. That's great. Um, or maybe they end up, it ends up that what you thought was a problem wasn't a problem at all, and you know you need to bail out on that one and come up with something new. But once you've talked to maybe a dozen, maybe two dozen of these different guitarists in different groups, you're going to see where the clumps of similarities are. Go, ah, electric guitarists have a lot of trouble. Acoustic guitarists, not so much. Or people in the South are well-equipped. People in the North are missing something. Um, as you start to see those groupings, then you know that that's kind of where your market segments are, and you can begin to get a sense of the size of the problem. 
once you know kind of what the questions are you want to ask, then you can do bigger kind of survey kind of things where you send out, you know, an email to 50,000 guitarists and you say, are you having trouble finding service? Are you an electric guitarist or acoustic guitarist? Are you over 50 or where are you? And you know then what those questions are and you start getting back thousands of responses. Then you get that kind of quantitative data. And the quantitative data is going to be really useful because then you can do the survey and you can say, hey, of 500,000 you know, guitarists in North America, they spend an average of $75 a month on guitar repair. Their average guitar repair guy is 150 miles away. And if we can come up with a better solution for that, we can make X hundreds of thousands of dollars and suddenly you have a financial model to propose to your executives because that's what they're going to want to see. And once you can convince them, you start by going, okay, well, this is the money we can make. You go, you talk to your engineers and say, okay, what's it going to cost us to make this and how long? And then you build a little financial model about that, right? If you get something that's going to make a bunch of money really soon, or it's, that might be worth something that's going to make a bunch more money, but it's going to take you three years to get there. So it's going to be those kind of conversations. You go to the executives and go, okay, this sounds like a good plan. Um, and you have to show them, well, this is why we want to do this instead of that, because I'm going to make more money than the other guy's stuff is. And so it's, you want to have your evidence laid out. Then once you get there, then you have to start digging into the weeds. And that's when you start working into product design. You start getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You go from macro down to micro to where that thing is two pixels to the left. These letters look crunched together. And you work through the whole development cycle. You get it released. You start uh, verifying it with other customers to sort of go, okay, hey, listen, this is what we've designed. Is this going to work for you? Then you watch them use the product and see, is this working? Is it not working? Um, you'll look at how many times they click on something, where they get confused, iterate on the design, fix it up. When you get it really good, you put it out there. And once the product's released, you have to go back into macro again. You have to start describing to your salespeople. Why is this product good? Why do people want to buy this? To your marketing people, what is the value to the customer? And you need to start tracking your metrics. So you go back to the executive and go, look, we made even more money than I told you we were going to make. So that's all good. And round about the time you get there, it's time to start the cycle all over again. Because once you get that product out, then the customers are going to come to you and go, yeah, this is great, but it'd be even better if it just did this. And then you're back into, you're back into starting all over again. Uh, so a couple of uh, user questions. I love that example. A, a couple of quick uh, student questions that were submitted ahead of time that tie into what you're describing. Um, so for an Adobe scale, what would an Adobe scale user interview process for either you know uh, qualitative going out and talking to folks and also quantitative surveying folks? Is that talking to 50 people or 5,000 people? Um, the fun thing about this is that the process is basically the same regardless of where you work. So I've worked at companies where I was employee number 12, and here at Adobe I'm probably employee number 12,000 this year. I, who, who knows? My orientation day, they were bringing on 150 interns on the same day. So it's a very different scale of uh, organization. Um, at some of my previous companies, I was responsible for customer research. Uh, directly. Here at Adobe, um, we have an experience design group. The experience design group does a lot of customer research, and we actually have an anthropologist on that group. So if there's anybody uh, taking this class who's an anthropologist or a cultural geographer or anything like that, take heart because you too can get a real job. Um, but I love that we have an anthropologist on staff. We have a different, a different group, which is the marketing information organization, and they run surveys. In fact, they will send out a survey to see if you want to take the survey. Uh, so I just went through that. So they sent out, um, I told them I wanted to talk to a dozen of a certain type of customer. They sent out a survey to a hundred different customers based on different criteria that I gave them and came back to me with a list of 20 different people who would be willing to speak to me. And so I will go out and talk to them. And then if I want to run a survey, they will run a survey out to 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 customers at a time and get really quantitative data back. This is all great infrastructure to have. There's nothing here that you can't do by yourself on your own if you need to. And the process is very much the same. You start out with those in-person interviews, trying to get the broad picture of what don't you know 
and then you narrow it down to the more uh, the more quantitative things when you know what the questions, the specific questions are that you want to ask, and what the data is that you need uh, that you need for those. Does that answer that question? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and it. it it points to the the diversity that you mentioned before of how you know really you know you need to understand a lot of different skills uh, in order to have this role and so we have a, a question from uh, so soon park uh, who writes in um, it seems like uh, product managers come from various backgrounds um, if he you if he ultimately wants to land in a product management position but he's coming directly from school or as a recent grad, um, what should his career choice be in order to land there? Um, you're right. There's a, a lot of different ways to get into product management. Um, you can take classes and become a trained product manager. That's not usually what happens. There's not a lot of degrees out there in product management, which is not to say it's not good to study all of these disciplines and understand what product management is because that's really – that's really what's what's required. I don't think you'll get a degree in product management anywhere, but it's a combination of factors that can get you into product management. By and large, product management is a fairly senior role. It is, uh, you are the product owner. You are responsible for the success or failure of that product. You are the person who people come to when they need an answer. How does this work? Why does this work this way? How can we change it? Is it possible to make it work a different way? Um, and that's a lot of that's a lot of responsibility, especially if you're going to have people uh, investing large sums of money in the development and and promotion of your product. Now, a lot of people are going to end up being product managers by starting their own companies and not realizing, oh, by the way, you're going to be product manager because you don't have one, so that makes you product manager. So if you have a one person, a two person, a ten person startup, a lot of times the CEO is the product manager for a long time. And that's why I'm saying, regardless of where you come from, it's worth knowing what the disciplines are, what the techniques are. A lot of people are hired as product managers because of their industry knowledge. So when DigiDesign hired me, it was because I had a background as a recording engineer, as a video producer, and I knew a little bit about how software was made. And so they were primarily interested in my industry experience. But I was very fortunate in that I was hired by a person who knew that they could train me if I had the basic kind of capabilities that they could train me to be a good product manager. And this is the thing about being hired from straight out of the field. Yes, you can bring tremendous industry knowledge with you because you've been in the industry, but the minute that you leave that industry and you become a product manager, that knowledge becomes starts to become stale if you don't have good product management skills, if you don't know how to go out and talk to people who are still working in the industry so you know what's going on now or what's coming, then all of that industry knowledge will do you no good in a year to two years anyway. So it's really about having those skills. Now there are other places to learn the kinds of skills that you need to be a product manager. Um, interestingly, one of the um, places where product managers often come from, directly or indirectly, is customer support. If you start into a job, let's say you got a position, let's say you really cared about uh, music software and you got a job doing customer support at Line 6 or at Universal Audio, guess what you would spend your day doing? You would spend your day on the phone talking to customers, figuring out what the problems are that they're having, and helping devise solutions for them. This is very much what product managers do. Um, another place where they often come from is test. So if you have a product that you know really well and you can get a job in the test department, you will learn the ins and outs of that product in great detail, and you will also devise ways to make the product work better and end up working closely with the product managers to help them design better solutions. So those are both um, really good ways into product management. Sometimes you can come in from sales or from marketing because again you learn the product, you learn the customers. If you are good at explaining why the customers do what they do, why the product should do something to address that, and you can communicate that clearly um, then you can be you can find a position in product management. Well, that's great. Uh, we we, I mean, we have a, that was probably the most common question is, um, can I apply for this role coming straight out of school, or you know, I'm interested in doing a career change. We have you know a, 
uh, a student student in Italy who's uh, wondering, you know, should he concentrate on building up connections uh, at companies so he can at least get a job interview? You know, is is having your own network of people you can draw upon is that is that something that could distinguish somebody from the rest of the pack? Assolutamente, sin alcun dubbio. Yes, uh, contacts are always important. Uh, and it, it's good because a lot of times these jobs, product management jobs are generally pretty highly coveted, um, but people also want to work with the people that they know and people that they like. And especially if you're coming in from the industry, if you build relationships with the product managers in the companies and they have an opening and they have a customer who they know and trust who has been able to give them great feedback, who's been able to give them great ideas, um, and been able to sort of explain where the industry is going, have that sense of vision, uh, it's very possible to get in, uh, to get into a product management position like that. The other uh, thing that I would suggest is build a product of your own, figure out what it is that you're, uh, what it is that you're interested in, something that you feel like you have some special talent in or some area of expertise in and build your own product. We're just adding a, um, a product manager here <clears throat> next week who started and ran her own company for five years. And so she was never a product manager per se, but she's going to be a killer product manager here because from running her own company, she learned all of its essential skills. So I'm really looking forward to having her. Awesome. Awesome. I, you know, uh, uh, as a couple more questions, questions are coming in. Um, I think there's actually an, an interesting thing that you and I were talking about earlier that might, answer a, a number of these questions of people wanting to know um, the overall kind of process, um, you know, one more time of like uh, hearing a, going out, finding a need and then taking it kind of ends to ends, especially on a path that you might not have thought was possible. And the, the problem I was thinking of was um, this, this problem that uh, you some of your industry knowledge to discover of how motion picture studios were taking you know, hard drives and FedExing them or, or currying them around the country. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience uh, at, at DigiDesign when you were looking at this problem? Yeah, so I was, um, I was about year three at DigiDesign and I was in Las Vegas after a trade show exhausted and really looking forward to a long road trip to just decompress. And I got a phone call from the CEO said, hey, we need you to come back right away. And I was like, really? right away. It's like, yeah, no, really right away. We just acquired a company and we need somebody to take over the integration for this. And I was like, okay. So I hopped my car, drove back and they had just acquired a company that had very interesting technology for doing technology for doing online collaboration of music production. And they'd been at it. It was a little startup in San Francisco. They'd been at it for a couple of years. They were having a lot of trouble and we're about to pretty much go under. Um, but DigiDesign felt like the technology was useful and wanted to build something that was going to very much model that and just basically take what they had built and, and, and start on it. And so I came in with fresh eyes and looked at what they had and talked to the engineers. And I went around to some of the customers that I knew, a number of the customers. I just got on the phone like that day and started talking to them while I was driving back from Vegas. And began to understand what the essential. There were a couple of core sort of problems with the technology and the product that had been that had been developed that they had purchased. So when I got back, I talked to some of the engineers, and I was like, and the engineers were feeling they were a little disgruntled. They, you know, they'd been in a startup, they had equity, suddenly they're working for a big company, and it's like they know this, is, you know, they were not happy. And I said, so what is it that you guys have had in your back pocket? What is the thing that you've been working on in your spare time that makes you excited? And they said, well, we have this little thing, we have this idea, it's a box, and it, basically what it does is it just does file transfers, but it would just do it in a really, you know, do really big files and do it really fast and really secure, Just, but just like make it really simple because it ended up that that's what most people were doing with the other technology anyway. So this whole collaboration thing about I record this track while you listen to it, you record this track and stuff, and we share this and stuff, really at the end of the day, people were just using it to get files back and forth. And so this was a very pared down way to do that. So we talked about it for a little bit and I got back on the phone because I had a number of other customers in a completely different area, which was the film industry. So my clients used to be Warner Brothers Audio, Disney, Fox, 
um, the major film studios, all of their audio uh, production departments. And when they release a movie, uh, they'll release it in 450 different versions and usually in 37 different languages. And what that meant at the time was that they would have to make a videotape of the video that was of the film that was still being edited. As soon as they got this sort of English version close, they would take a videotape and they would put it in FedEx or DHL and they would ship it around the world to 20 different countries and have people look at it, cast for it, send tapes back, then they would send more tapes back, and then they would get the audio dubbed in the different translations, and then they would send more tapes back. And basically, it was taking about six weeks between the time that the English version of the film went out and the foreign language versions of the film could go out, because it took that long to get the translations and the dubbing done. And in that six weeks, there was a huge amount of pirated copies being sold in all those countries because people wanted to see it. They didn't want to wait six weeks, so they'd go out from some guy in a pickup truck or a van and buy some VHS of it in English for 12 bucks and whatever and go home and watch the movie. So I knew that there was this problem, and it was taking basically it was taking seven days for them to get a videotape from Hollywood to Moscow because of flights and customs and everything. And I said, listen, if we had a little box that you put on your network behind your firewall so you feel safe about it, and a very simple interface that just lets you move video files and audio files, but like several 20, 30 gigabytes at a time, and it was just a little train that just chugged away, but it got the stuff there for you overnight, would that be any help? And they just started to sort of blanch. They were like, really? You think you could do that? Um, and so I talked to half a dozen of the studios who said, yeah, I'll take 12 of them, I'll take this many, it'll save us. And basically what I said was, if you weren't doing DHL fees, and if you were really able to release your film earlier, how much money would that be worth to you? And we were suddenly talking hundreds of thousands of dollars per studio. So I went back to the CEOs and I said, hey, opportunity here, let's take this thing that you just paid a bunch of money for, and let's just put it on a shelf for a couple minutes. We'll do this as kind of a proof of concept. This will be stuff we will all build on. It'll be a stepping stone. And what's more, it will come to market a lot faster. And so the CEO said, well, okay, we'll trust you on this one, but you've got six months and two guys, and it better be good. It's like, okay. So we ran off, and in six months, we built this little box, and it did basically that. It was just really good, high-quality file transfer. Now, this was before you send it, and um, Box, Dropbox, those kind of things were around by long shot. But we put it to market in six months, and within the next six months, we had sold them to all the major studios, and they, were, they had brought down the turnaround time on translations to where they could actually release the foreign language versions the same day and date as they go out in English. And there's still a lot of companies that, that use this box. So it was a way to kind of get in and really change the way the whole industry worked with just what was a very simple, basic idea. And can you, I, I mean, I, I love that example. And can you talk about um, when the box shipped? What is your role? There's, there's some confusion about what is, you know, what is your role? And Kareem writes another question. Um, you know, what is your role after the product ships? And, you know, then uh, his follow-on is, how much of your time do you spend doing sustaining work on existing products that you are responsible for versus new product development? Um, both interesting questions. So uh, in this particular case, there was a major challenge to explain to somebody why they would want to spend ten, twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars on a single rack U server, which you could go out and buy the server yourself for a thousand dollars. And uh, you could always email things or you could use FTP for free. So why would you go out and spend all this money on this little box? So that was very much a challenge of explaining first to the marketing people, second to the salespeople, what the actual benefits were to the customer. And that involved things like security, like pointing out cases where these tapes had been bootlegged. There was a guy running a FedEx truck with a CD printer in the back of it at one point, and he was bootlegging movies and records on the way to the duplicating plant. So he actually was selling them before they were even before they were even pressed. So those kind of security nightmares 
uh, were a relatively easy sell. Um, comparative speeds, how long it takes to get a tape back and forth, doing sample workflow things. Of you, know, you do this step, this step, this step, this is how many times you save, this is how much it's costing you per hour for this talent, um, and this is how it works. And just really being able to explain that value to the customers. Once we got the marketing stuff together and once we got the sales training together, so I had to sit with the sales guys and train them how to sell it, then I ended up going to a lot of trade shows. Fun because that's where you get the that's where you get the feedback and it's it's you know if you've got a good product it's good for your ego I won't lie it feels good to have you know what makes me happy as a product manager is to have somebody look at something I built and go oh this is going to make my life so much easier and that just makes me happy because that's that's what I do I do tools for people um, that part's fun now having said that um, you will find that ninety percent at least ninety ninety five percent of product development is iterative. It's building on stuff that's already been built. And that's not just for me, but that's just products in general. Um, there are very few things that come really from scratch. They're fun when they do, they're exhausting, they're risky, uh, but the bulk of the money, the bulk of the development work, the bulk of um, kind of product development in general is iterative. It's based on things that were already built in one shape, form, or another. So there's a lot of maintenance work uh, that's done, but it doesn't have to be boring. It doesn't, it's not really maintenance work. You look at it as improvement, and it's really easy to think, wow, once I built this, it's going to be great. But believe me, the minute you get it out the door, there's going to be a dozen more things you're going to want to do with it, and that list never seems to end. The to-do list, the wish list never seems to come to an end. I've never ran into a product that I said, yeah, this is done. So that can be a lot of fun. Let's, let's keep on that theme of, of early stage product creation because – um, we got a, qu a question that was just submitted um, where a, a student or a viewer wants to, uh, in, in his words, um, he wants to build a product like Square Company did. So um, I think he might mean Square. Um, so payment processing and uh, basically re-revolutionizing how small merchants are able to, to operate as businesses. Um, so he has a great idea, and he wants to create a team who can create this product. Uh, so uh, you've been in small startups before. Um, if he has the idea and he wants to put together a team to kind of go off and execute, what are what are some good tangible next steps? Um, if product development is not something that you've done a lot of and you don't have 15, 20, or 50 years experience in it, the best place to start is always to get good advisors because there are people out there who have a lot of experience and if you get a group of a group of good advisors you can get 100 200 250 years of good product development experience behind you to help direct you and this is worth everything it's something people rarely think of it's like i need to hire engineers i need to hire salespeople. no you need to find advisors because advisors will help you know who it is you need to hire, how to get the funding to do it, what the steps are that you really need to take, and then they'll help you to find those people so that you're building a really good, experienced team to support you. Having a great idea and execution are two completely different things. And the people who can execute, there's lots and lots of people who can execute well. There's very few people who have good ideas. So if you have a really good idea, focus on your strength, which is that idea. Take that idea and sell it. And there's lots of networking events. Jay runs a bunch of great events where you go out and rub shoulders with people, and you'll start finding out who you click with both on a business perspective and on a personal uh, perspective because those people who are going to be your advisors, you're going to be slightly married to for a couple of years. So you want to find people who really bring things to the table for you, and they will clear the path for you beyond that. So that's really my best advice. And, and the, it's funny because as you were saying that, the follow-on question immediately popped onto my screen um, of, but how do you get advisors? <laughs> you know, it's all networking. It has a lot to do with where you are. Um, if you are in one of the tech centers, whether you're in New York, you're in uh, the Bay Area, whether you're in L.A., um, or, you know, even the non-tech centers that you wouldn't think of, Chicago, Dallas, uh, places in Europe, places in things, there are... Um, all kinds of good events. There are 
uh, that you can go and attend and meet people. There are um, places like uh, AngelList where you can go and just hang out on the chat rooms and see how other people are doing it. Um, there's, yeah, and there are people who are much better at starting companies than I am. So I, I think online is always a great place to start start your research. Um, and it, one of my favorite, one of my all-time favorite books on this, which is really, it's an easy read and it's really fun, is a guy named Guy Kawasaki wrote a book called The Art of the Start. The Art of the Start makes it, gives you really a good idea on how to get a startup off the ground. Um, it's an older book, but I think it's still perfectly valid. And it's like perfect product placement because the art of the start 2.0 actually just came out. Oh, no kidding. Okay, good. So there you go. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Uh, great, great feedback. Um, and one, one little thing I can, I can maybe add on there. Uh, it might seem really appealing to just want to wrangle up all sorts of uh, good advisors, but um, consider what will happen if you are successful. If you have advisors, then they're going to be giving you advice. And so you need to not only respect them, but you need to enjoy working with them um, because there's, you know, you need to be willing to open yourself to harsh criticism. Um, and that's, you know, for me, when I would assemble um, advisory teams, you really don't need people who can just confirm what you're already doing. You want people who will challenge your thinking, but, you know, do so in a positive, constructive, uh, reflective way. Um, Awesome, uh, and thanks came in from uh, uh, from our viewers on that one. Um, all right, so uh, Owen just 